Good morning. They've released me and let me come up front, and I'm really looking forward to it. When I was talking to Kyle last week, I mentioned to him that he could warn you that I was going to be up here for a couple of weeks. And I know you probably haven't looked very closely at the back of his head or anything, but he's aging. Kyle's getting older also. All these young people in the church. And he's getting forgetful. So he didn't warn you last week. This, this is just a big surprise to you. Thank God I get to be up here. Kyle's going to get his haying done. I requested to be up here so he wouldn't have to be doing the message while the haying season is going on. It's a very busy time. I wanted to share some things with you before I get started, before we open in prayer. There's a lot in the Bible to be preached on. There's a lot of it that's applicable to us. I've always believed you pray to God and you ask Him, what do you want to be preached? Whether it's a book, a chapter, partials, whatever it is. And I'm going to be preaching a couple of texts this Sunday and next Sunday that for me... It was a lot to learn. For some of you that haven't been in the church very long, I want to share something with you. For those of you who have, if you'll just hang in there while you hear the story the 37th time. I got saved when I was 26 years old. And I was headed for prison or death. I lived a pretty rough life. And... I was raised in a denominational church. My mother took me to church every Sunday from birth till about 13. When I got saved at 26, I didn't know there was an Old and New Testament. I couldn't have named the four Gospels. I didn't know anything about the Bible. So as a new believer, when God would show me something, and by His grace, turn the light on that I, here's a truth that needs to be imparted into my life. For me, they were more than just aha movements or this is really neat. This was life changing for me. This was so different from the way that I had lived. So this week and next week, I'm sharing with you a couple of the little passages that God showed me from reading Scripture that in the condition I was in and in the early stages of my growth, it was like a giant light turned on and this is the way you need to be living. And I'm still learning that. So I wanted to share them with you uh, if that needs to be the case for you today. This is brand new or you didn't know that or this is something you've been thinking about or it's something God's been working on with you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we want you to be pleased. We want you to be honored. We want to depend totally on you. Lord, I pray for each heart and mind out here that they are listening to your word. They're listening to what you want to say to them. And then they act on it. By your grace, they act on what you show them. And they leave here not just attending a church service, but they leave here with a truth of your word that has been activated in their lives and they're going to do what you want them to do with it and keep on doing it. So we just praise you for the almighty, faithful, holy God that you are, the God who loves us. And we're so grateful for learning that and uh, having it refreshed in Sunday school. This is who you are. This is how you act. We just praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 22 years old, I had a few more months in the Navy before I mustered out. I had some very good friends. One of my friends said he wanted to 
sit down and talk to me about something. Because I couldn't wait to get back to Idaho. Born and raised here, had a wife, had a child. And what he proposed to me was, his dad was a wealthy businessman in Wisconsin. He owned a very large construction company. He mainly worked in three states around Wisconsin. And he wanted to retire. So he wanted his son to take over the business who was getting out in the next week or so. And he wanted me to be the vice president. So this is what the son is conveying to me. We're both going to start at the bottom, at the lowest end of how to work for this company. And he figured in about two years, we'd make it up to the top. That's when he wanted to retire. This fellow was a really good friend, but I wanted to go to Idaho pretty bad. We were in port, not out at sea. We had landline hooked up, and I was told I had a telephone call, important. So I was able to go answer the telephone, and when I answered it, it was his father calling from Wisconsin. And his father offered the same situation to me. When you get out, if you would come up here to Wisconsin, I will start you at the bottom and you will be vice president in a couple of years. And you will become a very wealthy man. His son, my good friend, did go back and do that. And by 50, he retired and he was a very wealthy man. I, on the other hand, went back to North Idaho to my lovely wife and my daughter and had fond, fond memories of Upper Pack River, Upper Big Lightning, Mirror Lake, mountains. And I said, no offense to anybody that may have originally been from Wisconsin, but the area of Wisconsin that we would have been living in back there was flat with cranberry bogs. And that just wasn't where I wanted to live. So I made this decision based on what I wanted for my life and my family's life, and we've basically lived here most of our lives. If you would turn, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 14 and 15. And the way we're going to look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 14, you have to go back to the context. So if we go back to the context before this, I want you to look at the last phrase. So if we look at what Paul was dealing with here with this church in Corinth, this is actually the third letter. There's a lost letter in between. The first letter that he had to write was a pretty strong, hard letter because this was a church doing their thing. And I, when I preached through 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, this was the me church. Hey, it's all about me. I do whatever I want. He had to write another one. God chose not to have that for us to have. What we know as 2 Corinthians is the third letter. And in the third letter, there are people that have actually listened to what he had to say. But there's still problems going on. So he writes to deal with those problems. The last phrase in verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 5, it is for you. It is for you. Paul, the author of half the New Testament, a man who used to persecute and kill Christians, God now uses to go to the Gentiles and take the love of Christ, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And he says in verse 14, 
after we decide is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. The love of Christ controls us. Study this word out. You are an American, whether you were born or raised here or not. And you like to be in control. I like to be in control. We like to be in control. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. And here you have a verse saying, controls us. So if you'll study that word out, you'll find out it means compels. We're compelled by the love of Christ. How big is the love of Christ? You ever sit around and discuss doctrine? That's the truth of Scripture. Man chose to sin, and Adam, we all sinned. We're going to keep on sinning. Why not just stay up in heaven and let it do itself in? God is love. He's not going to do that. He didn't do that. I get the privilege of doing the attribute of love. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know to what extent that he loves you? Do you know how long that he loves you? For the love of Christ controls us or compels us. Compels us. If I'm going to have something compelling me, it's the motivation for doing things, what would that be? Well, the love of Christ is about as good as it gets. The love of Christ compels us. When you look back on that day, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you were at, whatever you were doing, when the Spirit of God got a hold of you, and you recognized for the first time ever in your life, you might have heard it before, but bang, you're a sinner. Sinners go to hell. Sinners don't get to be with God. What do you do now that you're a sinner? Well, he died so that you could be saved, so that you could know Christ and go to heaven. That's the gospel. That's the good news. He shared that in 1 Corinthians 15. In a nutshell, you have to have heard the gospel. Even if you can't hear, God's going to get the gospel through to you. And then by his grace, you have to act upon it. Once you come to know Christ, because you might not know anything when you get saved. I did not. How does the love of Christ compel you? What does that look like? Well, it got our marriage back together. I wanted to grow. I couldn't grow where I was at. We did some of the most drastic things we've ever done in our lives. Decisions I didn't want to make, but as at the head of the family, it came up to me whether we made the decision. So an old homeboy, born and raised here, same with Cork, we sold everything we had. We liquidated everything to have no debt. To move out in the middle of Montana on a wheat and barley ranch with Gelvie cattle. Do you know what Gelvies are? I didn't. Only the love of God, what he had done for me, could get me out of this state, out of where I was born and raised, and take all of us and put us somewhere else. The day we arrived there, it was 50 below zero with 55 mile an hour winds. State patrol said you couldn't be on the roads. Welcome to Montana. We were there for four years and then came back to this church that had been started. 
Why would anybody in their right mind spend most of their life working with people? Well, if you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist, I can understand it at 200 bucks an hour. That makes a little bit of sense. But I don't know many pastors that get overpaid. So why would a person do that? I get no credit. I get no glory. Because I questioned it a lot myself. Are you sure I'm the person you want working with people? I had a lot to learn. And you know how you learn to love people and work with them? You get to be with them. It's been amazing. The love of Christ, the love of Christ compels us. What has he done for you? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to live with him forever? These are more than just doctrines in the Bible. They're more than just glib statements that we can make in Christendom. This should really mean something to us. This will be from the bottom of our hearts. This is who I am and this is what he's done for me. You should be able to say that. And because of his love, these truths are all going to be true. For the love of Christ controls us or compels us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Now I know you don't, didn't know this, but universal salvation, here it is. That one died for all, therefore all died. I say that because we also lived up in the New England states for a while. And there's a church up there called the Universal Church. Everybody's saved. Doesn't matter what you believe, how you act, what you do, everybody's saved. That's not what this means. It's not what it means at all. If you go to all of Scripture, Old Testament pointing to the front, Looking back at the cross, so whether you're studying the doctrine of the cross, the doctrine of the death of Christ, there's a lot of scripture you need to look at and learn from. When Christ died on that cross, the provision was made for all. The provision was made for whosoever. But the way is narrow. There's not many people going to make that choice. So the provision's been made they can be forgiven, but it has to happen the way Scripture says. Grace and faith. So even though this is a true thing, that's not what this is saying here. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. This is one of those places in Scripture where if you practice good hermeneutics, and many of you have been trained in that, taught that, all doesn't mean all. You're going, what do you mean all doesn't mean all? In the context. So I'd like you to go to Romans 6, please. Keep your finger back here at 2 Corinthians. Go to Romans 6. Romans has got to be the doctrine book of the Bible. Here it is. Here's what Christianity is. In Romans chapter 6, you start out with verse 1. So now that I'm saved now and grace is abundant, can I just sin all I want? Absolutely not. So here he goes into this doctrine of what it means. And when we get to Romans 6, 8, because we are not to be slaves to sin. It's not supposed to be in control of our lives anymore. In Romans chapter 6, verse 8. Now if, that's a condition that has to be met. Now if we have died with Christ, you know Christ is your Savior? Did you come to know Him? Do you have a testimony that you can give? If that's true, then you have died with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with him. 
This is the cornerstone truth here. If you're a believer, when you come to know Jesus Christ, basically you're going back to the cross, the crucifixion, Christ hanging there, Christ dying for the sins of the world, and he paid the price that needed to be paid. He paid the ransom. And because you've come to know him personally, you died in him at that cross also. Because of that, you can now live for him. Sin is no longer your master. You don't have to come up with excuses. Well, I sinned, but, but you know, I had a rough day. And that's not what a Christian is supposed to be doing. What a, a Christian is supposed to be doing is recognize who they are and what's been done for them. And they're not going to do it themselves, but by that indwelling Holy Spirit, by the grace of God, by the truth of His Word, I want you to go to verse 11, please. So we looked at 6.8, go to verse 6.11. This is what you need to do. This is what I have to do. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is an action that you are supposed to take by the grace of God, controlled by the Holy Spirit. You say no to sin, I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. And you're going to do what God wants. Study it out. Romans 6, 11 in its context. I'm not sinning. I don't have to sin. I died with Christ back on that cross. He wants me to live for him. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 15, And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. So he paid the price. It was a provision for all. It's only going to be good for the ones that come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they died in Christ back at that cross so they can live for him now. Now, you might not have heard of this if you're new here, but most of you have heard about this. In my office, I have a big board when I leave the office. So I look at it every time I come in, and I can't leave the office without looking at these boards. These are truths that I believe God has put on my heart for me. They're for you too, but really impressed on me. And I've seen it work in my life, exactly what God said he would promise you to do. So I'm a little old North Idaho boy, blue collar, and God sends me to Bible school and then wants me to pastor a church. You can't do it in yourself. You can't. This is a promise. I know you can't see it from back there. I'm going to read it to you. Nothing is too big for my God to accomplish. And nothing is too little for him to use in accomplishing it. Don't ever count yourself out for how God can use you in the life or the ministry of someone else. You live in a world... where there's horrible atrocities, massacres and murders, excuses, the list just goes on. And within Christendom, and I'm making that really big and I'm putting a quotation mark around that, sin has all but disappeared. And you look at that and you go, how can that happen? Look what the Bible says. How can sin almost have all disappeared? I'm going to ask you a name. Just, just nod your head if you know this name. I don't expect any of you young people to know it unless you had a very, very good class by somebody. Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller. If you don't know who he is, you should find out. Orange County, California, the Glass Cathedral, Flying Angels at Christmas time. 
I did a lot of teaching in this church to warn people about Robert Schuller. I'd like to read to you a quote. This is out of Time Magazine, March 18th, 1985. How far back in history is that? 1985. There was a date like that. There was a real time. 1985. This is Robert Schuller speaking. I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that under the banner of Christianity has proven more destructive to human personality and hence counterproductive to the evangelism enterprise than the often crude, uncouth, and unchristian strategy of attempting to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. He was the avant-garde for the devil in Christendom to get sin <clears throat> out of the church. He was the devil's advocate. How big is God? Do you know his son got saved? The church went bankrupt? There is justice in the end. You might just have to wait for it for a while. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. Living for yourself. It's what we want. It's what I want. It's what the sin nature wants. It's what the flesh demands. Living for yourself. How bad can that get? How big is the battle you've had to fight? Living for self. What self wants? Before I was a Christian, at a high school basketball game, that's where the middle school is now, it was a brand new high school when Corky and I went to it. There was a game going on. I looked across the court. There's hundreds of kids over there. I looked across the court, and can you believe it? All these people talking to each other were talking about me, and the more I saw them doing it, the madder I got. And they wouldn't quit. They kept looking at each other and looking at the ground, looking at each other, talking, and they're talking about me, and I'm getting madder and madder. To the point I was about ready to get up and go over there and confront them. Want to know the truth? Probably didn't even know I was on the other side, and none of them were talking about me. But that's the lie I was believing. That's how self-centered we can get. This truth says... That love of Christ should compel you that you no longer live for yourself. It's about others. Go back up to that statement in verse 13. It is for you. It is for you. I've shared many times from up here and in studies, one of the greatest devices that God ever came up with to mature you as a Christian is called Marriage. Take two people that don't see eye to eye on everything, that may have come from different cultures or something, different belief systems, put them together, those vows, and are they going to really keep those vows? And now what happens? And boy, I'll tell you, it's a very good way to grow if you use it correctly, if it's the way it's supposed to be. And he died for all so that they who might live no longer live for themselves, Here's our second point. But for him. But for him. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now here's the simple biblical formula as it comes out. You have to make a decision. I'd like to do this. Well, maybe I'd like to do this. This is workable too. So all you got to do is work through those things you would like to do. Do you know what this passage does for you? What does Christ want? What does Christ want you to do? Now you got to know the Bible. You got to know what God's Word says because you need to know what He wants you to do. Now it goes back to being in church, learning from each other, studying, 
your own personal devotions. There's all kinds of things involved here from Scripture. I need to know what Christ wants me to do. Because when you get to that judgment seat, that's another whole doctrine, you get to go there because you are a believer. It's for believers. But it's on what you did down here in the flesh and what you did in the spirit. And you don't want to take a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble up there. It's all going to burn. Here's what you want to do. That's great. What does he want you to do? What does he want to go through you as a person, giving you the strength and the power in that whole armor of God, compelled by his love, controlled by the Spirit, working with the truth of his word? What does he want you to do? That's what 2 Corinthians 5 14 and 15 is about. No longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. There's a gauge that you can use as to whether this is working well or not. I want to give you some scriptures real quickly. Let's go to Romans 14. Romans 14. We've already been through all the doctrine. Now we're looking at putting the doctrine into practice from chapter 12 on. Romans chapter 14. If you mark in your Bible, you might put a mark here. Romans 14, 7 and 8. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. You know Philippians 121. Let's go to Philippians 3.14. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's go to 3.14. This is what the last Sunday school study that I did was based on. Philippians 3.14 I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You want to go home not just to escape ache and pains, old age, all the horrible stuff going on on this planet. That's not why you want to go home. You want to go home because he saved you and you've lived for him. And you get to go be with him forever. Let's look at Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Okay, I want to read this to you. If you'll follow along in Colossians 3. And then if you mark in your Bible, I'm going to go back and ask you to make some marks. Colossians chapter 3, I'm going to read 14 through 17. Beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Why don't you underline be thankful? Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Why don't you underline with thankfulness? Remember the illustration not long ago of couldn't hear anybody? We're supposed to be singing with thankfulness. We're so grateful that we're saved and we're singing to our Lord. And verse 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And if you'd underline giving thanks. The love of Christ compels us. We didn't deserve to be saved. 
We didn't do anything to get saved. We're not worthy of it in any way. And yet God has it available to us. And if we get saved, he's going to bring us to the place, hey, it's not about you. You're to be living for me. You should be grateful for what I have done for you. And it's not a have to, not in that sense. You want to. Ask yourselves, are you grateful? Are you grateful to the Christ who died on that cross for you? Are you grateful to the working of the Holy Spirit that he worked on you and convicted you that you were a sinner and you've been presented with the gospel? And what do you do with the gospel? If you came to know Jesus Christ, you are saved and you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and you are capable of understanding these truths and doing these truths in God's power and then going home and being with him forever. Does that call for a grateful heart? This is Augustine, clear back in the history of the church. Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. Thanksgiving. To truly be thanksgiving is first thanks and then giving. Thanksgiving, to truly be thanksgiving, is first thanks, then giving. So whether you're a well-educated person like the Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul, whether you're a rugged fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, no matter what your station of life is, where you start, when Christ gets a hold of you and you come to know him, there's one common factor that should be found in the life of a true believer. Are you truly grateful? Do you live for him? So as you leave this morning, I'm asking you that question to put before the Lord and have the Holy Spirit show you, who are you living for? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for all that you are, all that you do. And we thank you that your plan is perfect. You've carried it out at great cost. And we thank you for the person of Jesus Christ who willingly came, paid the price. And all that that means for someone that's come to know Christ is our Savior. And Lord, I pray that the world would know that we've come to know Christ as our Savior. That the saved and the unsaved would know that we are compelled by your love to be living for you. And we don't just talk it, it shows that we are so grateful. We love you from a grateful heart. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.